And now I'd like to introduce uh, Adrian Cacho, uh, who is a front-end en engineer at Parcel. He has a unique background in developing interactive applications across different media. His career includes AR, VR, 3D on the web, and Web3 technologies. Hi, everyone. Oh, thanks for coming to the talk. This is really great. Um, my name is Adrian Cacho, and I'm going to be showing you a presentation on Parcel, which is the company I'm working with. And uh, together, we're working on making the metaverse a better place. So um, this is a talk about Web3. I know this is a UX conference. So it's, I'm going to introduce you guys to Web3, and I'm going to show you basically just how we're deciding, um, how we're making design decisions, and how we're getting users involved. Um, so let's start. Yeah, so although Web3 is in the title, um, you don't have to know anything about it. Um, essentially, as, you know, as, as developers and designers, our goal is to really get users to, um, to, to kind of go in the flow with our apps and um, really agree with, you know, get, have trust in us as a brand. Um, but I want to get an understanding of what is everyone's under, like, familiarity with Web3. So maybe with like show of hands, can anyone show me uh, if they know what blockchain is? I know everyone's heard of that term by now. OK, cool. Great. OK, what about smart contracts? OK, cool. Um, NFTs, I'm sure that, that's like a big one. OK, great. And then last one, does anyone know what the metaverse is? OK, cool, cool, cool. I would say I don't quite know yet. Um, so it's kind of a true question, but we'll get into that. So. Um, yeah, let's, let's go to the next slide. All right, so my name is Adrian Cacho, like I said. Um, this is a presentation by me, uh, my two coworkers, Eddie and Ariel. They helped me make the slides look nice and kind of give you a, a good narrative to this whole thing. Um, I joined Parcel in March. Um, before that, I was a new developer, so I was making AR and VR applications for all sorts of things. Um, and then um, actually last year was my first time really getting involved with the Web3 space. I was uh, making uh, websites for like a trading card game. Um, so that was bizarre, but also very interesting. And I learned a lot. So uh, from there, I joined Parcel. And uh, it's been great since. So yeah, let me uh, dive in more into like the projects I worked on. I feel like it's pretty relevant to this. Uh, so the first one was Intel TrueVR. Basically, it was a sports, spe sports spectating app. Um, you would put on a Google like or a VR headset, uh, Oculus headset and uh, watch games live, and you would get control which, which view you'd want at the time. So you could be behind the pitcher, you could be on top of a, a basketball hoop watching slam ducks in 3D. Um, so there's all these different options. The picture there you see is um, the, different, the UI that we had. So you would actually control which camera you wanted to switch to using your gaze. You would look at it, stare at it, and then you would see a dial appear after like a couple seconds, it would click you to the next thing. Um, so that was kind of just a, a concept of like how, how do users interact with headsets? Like what's the most convenient way that's less intrusive, right? Uh, next on the list that we have uh, Spotify and Magic Leap. So I actually made a Spotify application with Magic Leap. If you guys haven't heard of Magic Leap, it was another headset but with transparent lenses. So you could actually have augmented reality um, just experiences now, it, it would scan the room, it would find surfaces, and then use that to place your augmented reality content. So basically, I had this carousel show up, and you could uh, control your playlist and scrub through audio and things like that. Um, and the main challenge with this was really kind of treating UI as 3D objects and giving them that space. So kind of, and, and it was a persistent experience, meaning if you were to turn off the application, um, you would could come back to it, turn it back on, and so long as you were in the same room, the application should figure out where you were or where, like, remember that it was the same room and then re have all the same objects reappear. So having that in mind when we were creating application was the challenge. Um, and then thirdly, I worked at Vertebrae, which was um, an AR e-commerce website. Uh, well, more of like a pipeline. Basically, we would take in 3D models from everywhere, um, things like, um, like 3D Max or other kind of like drafting kind of um, applications or V-Ray. Um, these different like 3D modeling applications needed to kind of go into one normalized pipeline and then come out the other end as GLB files, which are 
more lightweight and uh, user-friendly for mobile devices, and that would lead to AR experiences. So um, yeah, you can see on that uh, image there, you have an augmented reality car with an interface with uh, annotation showing up to the user so they get some information about what they're looking at. Um, and yeah, and then last year, actually, they were acquired by Snap. So um, I got to work for them for a while. <clears throat> so yeah, I think it was important to show you these because um, in every case, um, we're kind of like reaching a new technology. We're kind of reaching something that's new to the user. And then the challenge is always, how do we get them to go along with the experience? Because there's always what we call, uh, internally we call it friction, um, there are points in the app or there are points where the, you could lose the user. You could do something where it's, the user doesn't feel like it. Like for augmented reality, it's like scanning a surface. If they don't know to move their camera around and look for a surface, then they, they could just close the app. And then you, you lose them before even getting them to the, the point that you want to make. Um, same with true VR and then same with the Spotify. It's like how do you get people to be familiar with holographic experiences? Um, like what does that even look like? Um, so yeah, it's relevant because now we're reaching a Web3. Um, this is the talk about Web3. So it's how do we get users to get into this whole like interactions with wallets? I don't know how if anyone's like bought. I know I got raised of hands of who knows what NFTs are, but I don't know like anyone's interactions with NFTs or other smart contracts. But um, there is definitely a learning curve as far as like interacting on that level. It's not just like putting in your credit card information. It's this whole like you have to deal with MetaMask or some other kind of wallet, and then it's like there's there is definitely a knowledge gap as far as like knowing what you are doing with wallets and um, and your digital assets. So yeah, we'll get into that in a second. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is a quick sizzler of Parcel so you get an idea of what our website is. So, yeah, we'll go into what it actually is now. Um, so it's a Web3 platform. Uh, the company was founded last year in July 2021. Um, we currently have around 15 full-time employees. Our vision is to see new experiences in the metaverse come to fruition. Uh, we want creative talent to shine in this space and provide them a means of displaying their art, making connections, ultimately get paid for their work um, in the metaverse with their digital assets. On the flip side, we want to empower investors who actually buy land. They may not be the creative types, but we want to get them involved and get them connected with creatives so that they can make their ideas become reality. Um, yeah, because really, if a virtual world has no points of interest or landmarks or anything interesting about it, like, is it a really world, like a world that you want to be a part of? Um, so we want to make all of these experiences great. We want to really flesh out what is possible and explore that avenue. So let's go over some key terms. Um, these might be basic. These might be new. Um, just to get everyone on the same page, again, this isn't a talk to sell you on any of this. This is really just a talk so that we can get into an understanding of the industry, uh, the landscape of it all, if you will, and uh, what we're doing as far as design decisions and UX to get users um, basically on our site and get involved. So first, we have the blockchain. Um, the blockchain, I mean, and again, these aren't definite or absolute definitions. These are just things, these are high-level concepts, so we can continue on with conversation. Um, the blockchain is a tool for conducting transactions. Every transaction made on the blockchain is made permanent, and we can always go back and look up that information later. With that, we can also pack in metadata on every X transaction, so we get some, so we can get basically a data lake of what is happening, um, and we can always, yeah, access it later. Um, you can use Explorer sites like Etherscan.io, which helps you look at one block, one, look at one transaction or a wallet and get a full history of what that wallet has, uh, what has done, or um, yeah, get like basically the raw information on NFTs or anything else. Um, by leveraging this data, you can extract information and get all sorts of metrics. Um, not only do individuals, or you could say wallets, which are the actors on the blockchain to partake on transactions, but we also have smart contracts. Um, smart contracts are automated operations that exist on the blockchain. They can process complex logic and interrupt with other contracts. Uh, you can think of smart contracts like vending machines in that you can give it an input and then something will work. It'll work in the background and provide an output. 
Um, most importantly, they can hold data or state, so that can change over time. As users keep interacting with the smart contracts, the state within the smart contract can change, and this gives us um, the opportunity to create exchanges like Uniswap or marketplaces like OpenSea, if you guys use them. They have an order book, and that order book changes over time as people interact with the smart contract. Um, so everything is actually built on smart contracts. Um, even different currencies are ERC-20. That's the class that they're given, the specification. And NFTs, right now, they're ERC-721. But in the future, that may change as the protocol changes. So NFTs could actually develop um, as far as like their functionality or what they can do. Um, I know, for example, we, there's discussion about now renting NFTs, so giving it to another user, but then becoming the, still the owner as you rent it out, and then there's like an expiration time, I believe. So there's, there's still room um, to develop these technologies and where they're going. We're not quite sure yet. We're, it's, still, it's still going. So let's see. Here we go. Okay. NFTs. NFTs stand for non-fungible token, though that doesn't really help in explaining what they really are. Um, in short, it's a digital asset that indicates ownership of a particular thing. Um, it could be a picture. It could be um, a property to a piece of land. It could be a ticket to an event or a membership pass. It could be all of those things. And it could be some things that we don't even know yet. Um, so really, it's just an indicator that you own a thing, but that thing can be anything, really. Um, virtual worlds, they're worlds where NFTs drive the content. Um, you could consider games like Roblox and Second Life to be virtual worlds, though the ones we're looking at today are specifically oriented around NFT functionality and being worlds where the creators really drive the content. So yeah, what is the metaverse? Uh, simply put, we don't really know yet, um, we, but we conceptually we can think of it as a domain where all of these virtual worlds are interconnected. It's an evolving digital landscape and will continue to evolve as we continue to experiment with what we can do in that, in that space. Um, so I'm sure, obviously, everyone started with Facebook, changing their name to Meta, you might think the metaverse belongs to them, but really the concept is an open sandbox for anyone to create in um, without really any central authority. So what do these virtual worlds look like? Well, here's an example of Decentraland. Um, this world is, um, is, is, is one where you can buy land and you, all the, the in-game assets are NFTs as well. Um, here's an example of um, basically some, some merch that we created in-game. This is a parcel suit and parcel glasses. I don't know if you saw it with the lines and the, the black suit with the lines. Um, those are actually NFTs, so we would actually deploy them to users, give them to, they would be in their wallets, and then when you jump on the Decentraland game, you sign in with your wallet, and the game registers, finds out everything that you have as far as like Decentraland assets, and now you can use them in the game. Secondly, we have Monoverse, which takes the whole metaverse thing a little bit differently. Um, basically, each world itself is an NFT. So now the creators have a lot more control of what, uh, what they can do as far as the world. They're not bound to their neighbors. They're not bound to a piece of land. Rather, they have the whole world of theirs to take control of. Um, and how this works is that each world is basically linked to other worlds using portals. So um, it's a pretty interesting concept. Each, like I said, each world is an NFT, and then each one is on the marketplace that you could buy. And then lastly, we have Sandbox. Um, it's a voxelized world where every avatar, in-game asset, and piece of land is an NFT, kind of like the central land. Um, it's not currently live to the public. It uses, they have alpha seasons. They're now on alpha season three. So uh, this is kind of the way for them to open the game up to users, get some feedback on what they want to change, and then keep going that way. Whereas the central land is already released, so you can play that now. Um, limited time events, and they, they're limited time events, and they average around 20 to 30,000 daily active users, to give you an idea. Um, I believe that Roblox and other games are still, uh, as far as like non-metaverse games, you can say like virtual worlds, though not NFT related, um, I believe they're still higher value. Like Roblox has more active users, but I don't think that will always be the case. Um, I think just in the future, that, that will definitely change. So um, yeah, let's break into more about what, what how these, uh, pieces of land are selling for, like what, how much. Um, so this is actually some data that we pulled from Parcel, and we actually pulled this data from the blockchain. So like I said, it's one giant data lake. You can go back and look at the transactions and um, basically just pull out any metrics you want and get an understanding of what the market's doing. Um, so yeah, you can actually see in Q2 there was a huge blow up. Um, it's, uh, I will say though, because now we're in Q3, um, 
it's, it's not quite this way. It doesn't keep going up. We all know the market um, is uh, NFTs and crypto isn't any different than what we're seeing in the market right now. Uh, yeah, so then let's break it down by world. You can see that Decentraland, um, uh, NF, like uh, NFT worlds, those are a few that are pretty big. And then just recently in this past quarter, over, over deed, um, other deed took over, uh, other side, sorry, other deed for other side, took over. Um, that's the um, uh, Board Ape Yacht Club uh, land. So they use Unreal Engine to develop their land and their metaverse sales blew up. Uh, so that kind of explains how last quarter went. And uh, so yeah, if, oh, also we just released the Q3 report. So you can check that out on parcelso.learn and we'll go over the, the learn site that we have. It's basically our blog site for giving out new information on the marketplace. So how big is the metaverse? Um, you can see that over $13 billion has been deployed already. Um, this year, that number has already grown to over $120 billion, so that's almost a 10x in, in the past year as far as pouring money into different, different avenues of this. 57% uh, of metaverse aware companies say that they are adopters. So that means over half the brands that are knowledgeable about the digital ecosystem are already actively participating by having in-game assets or having virtual land or you know, creating experiences there. So yeah, that's a lot of people already on board. Um, so yeah, that, hopefully that got you guys caught up on what the space is like. There's a lot of different worlds. There's a lot going on and it's really difficult for someone new to understand what they should be looking at. Like what is relevant, what is updated? Am I putting my money in the right place? Like this is real money, so is it, am I going to be spending it on a digital world that is ultimately gonna flop? Um, those are good questions to know, or good answers to know. Um, so yeah, like just going down the, the problem areas that we saw, there's many different worlds with their own rules and types of assets. How does even a creator develop the right 3D models to, to be compatible with different worlds? Um, if I make something and I want it to be deployed on Decentraland, what if I want that same asset to be on Sandbox or somewhere else? How do I make sure I get the most out of my effort when I'm creating assets? Um, secondly, uh, data is publicly accessible via the blockchain but lacks content. So like I was saying before, the blockchain is a giant data lake. We can extract all sorts of information about it. But how do we make that human accessible? How do we make that readable and something that I can understand um, so I can, you know, get on with my day. I can actually make money from this or I can create new experiences. Um, and then there's different players in the space. So how do we really connect them all? Um, just like an MMO, users have uh, different objectives involved. So like if I'm a virtual, if I'm a landowner, um, I'm really more interested in getting an ROI on my land. If I'm a creative person, I'm a, a content creator, I'm really interested in creating content and I want to get clients. So how do, we, how do we fuse these two? How do we get everyone happy together? Um, so our solution is actually creating three different websites. Uh, we have the Marketplace, Creativerse, and Learn. So with these, we're hoping to keep everyone in our ecosystem, basically, where they can kind of bounce between the three and, um, yeah, and, just, and just get involved that way, whichever, and enter at any point that they want. If they're newcomers, they can just use Learn as a, as a starting platform. If they're actually invested, invested in buying land, they could, buy, they could check out the marketplace. And then if they're just looking for even for inspiration or just curious about the whole, um, the whole, the whole idea of making digital assets, they can check out the Creativerse um, and they can find other users, they can find other artists and get some understanding about what that's like. So, okay, let's, let's dive into it more. Here's a picture of the marketplace. Um, you can see we have a banner, we show different worlds that are you know, upcoming. So other deed is one. Um, and then, yeah, just different cards um, showing you basically like the average value of what one piece of land is per world. Um, this is an example of a listing page of, for one piece of land. So with NFTs, there's metadata and different properties. Um, so for other deed, for example, there's like this, uh, this animal, this bear, it's called Koda, uh, which is Japanese for bear. But it's, um, it's, a, it's a property that lives on the, um, it's, it's a property that lives on the, on the piece of land and it goes for higher value than a lot of other pieces of land that don't have a coda on it. So it's, it's something that you want to check out. Um, next is Creativerse. 
So this is the platform I was speaking about where it's a digital, uh, it's a platform for digital artists to really show their work and to get hired, basically. Um, find clients, find other artists, find inspiration. Uh, yeah, all that. And then next we have Learn. So Learn is just the blog site, basically, for anyone to go and get a better understanding of the metaverse market. Um, yeah, you can go there. And like I said before, we just released our Q3 report. So you can go there and get an understanding of what the market is like right now. Um, yeah, so basically with all these three sites, we have two things powering it. We have the parcel API, and then we have third-party sites or sources. Um, there's not much info there to go there. But we do want to talk about how there's really no way to have components um, here. We found ourselves repeating a lot of code. We would create a header. We would create the wallet connecting. Uh, uh, we use React, so it's like a provider. Uh, we would use, we would recreate a lot of things. And so what we have to do is create a third repo or a fourth repo called the UI library, which brings everything together. Uh, we would use that with Storybook and Figma and basically just create new designs uh, that way and then redistribute them out to the rest of the sites. So yeah, here's a screenshot of Storybook and Figma. Um, I'm sure, I don't know what everyone's uh, experience with this is, but it's actually been a super great tool. Um, just going directly one-to-one -one from Figma designs straight into uh, isolated components. So here you have like a full circle of uh, all the tools that we use. Um, so yeah, here's just a little more fleshed out look. Basically with this, we can look at how we connect wallets, um, get prototyped this way in a sandbox, isolate the component, and just work with animations, work with the flow as far as connecting your wallet. Um, a same with uh, accepting an offer. So these are just the steps just a quick review of how one person buys an asset and then the different steps. And this gives us a chance to really look at it, write comments, and say like, well, I think there could be a point where I would get frustrated or I would actually want to see this information before I commit to clicking all these buttons and going through. So it's both, it's both great to have Figma to review these components and then in Storybook um, actually develop them and get some QA done and see what's actually technically uh, possible. So, okay, this, we're gonna go into the user journeys. What these are, are basically um, amalgamations of interviews we've had with users and get an understanding of what their problems are in the space. And from there, uh, we create our own heroes to the story. These are people that, um, they're fictional, but they're, their problems are ones that we find a lot in the space. So, let's go over one or two of them. Uh, first we have Dimitri. Dimitri is a creator. This is a lot of information, so not necessarily to read it all. But he's a creator, and he's looking to create, he's looking for some ROI on the assets that he creates and really um, find some clients. And, but he doesn't really know where to start. He doesn't really know uh, what world to build in or, or anything like that. He, he's developed with Unity and Blender and all these things, but beyond that, he doesn't um, have a clue. And then other than that, we have um, Samson here. Samson is a, a virtual land owner. He's basically an entrepreneur. He's gone through and like experimented with different uh, assets, different kinds of technology, and now he wants to get into the metaverse, but he needs someone to execute on his ideas. So yeah, here, here's a sample of Samson going through our products and how we how we foresee someone kind of experimenting or playing with the, the sites that we created. Um, so let's say, for example, that he finds a parcel, but he, um, he, yeah, he needs to find someone to build on it. So where does it really go? Uh, so you can see on each, each, each screenshot, we're highlighting the components that we believe help the user for that part of his journey. Uh, so here's a link right to the homepage. But there's a lot of information here. There's, there's so much going on. How do I even know what parcel is best for me? Uh, maybe I should filter down the options. What should I search for? So here we're highlighting the filter options. We're, we're really understanding that the filter, filtering and showing the best information for the user is really important so that they don't get overwhelmed by just the, the ongoing horde of listings that are on the site. OK, so I have a budget for this project, and I need to, half my, I need to use half my budget for land and the other half for the build. Um, how would I know how much to spend? So this highlights the hero section that we use on the pages of the worlds to show what the medium value is for each world and, um, or yeah, for each piece of land and what you can do from there. 
Um, so yeah, I see a lot of other brands on the site. Maybe I should buy something by them. This location looks good. I'm going to look at this listing. So yeah, we're just kind of clicking into each world, um, each page as they go from the world page into a listing page and getting an idea of what properties work best for them. Okay, so I'm familiar with this one. I paid with ETH, done. So they go through and they buy it, but now they need someone to build on it. So yeah, this is, this is also highlighting the areas that we see right now on our site. So for example, they can't quite see the NFTs that they own. That's something that we're still developing on. So it's, that's, that's a highlight that we're adding here. Like I can't see my NFTs, I can't see my parcel, but I'm actually gonna go and find a developer to build on my land now. So he's using the navigation site, or navigation, he navigation header, he's going to the Creativerse. And um, again, it's kind of overwhelming. You go to the Creativerse site and there's just a lot of art. Again, how do, you, how do you process what you want out of the site? So again, we're highlighting the filter system that we use for creations, helping him understand that, okay, he has land on Sandbox, so it's probably best to look for creators on the Sandbox, um, and that's what we do for creators. You can make a profile, and then you can define what worlds um, your assets um, are, are assigned to. And then we use links so that way you can kind of jump into each world, each space, and immediately start seeing that the, uh, the, the buildings that they created. Okay, so this profile looks good. Um, I think I'm gonna reach out to them. So they go over, they message them. Uh, right now we're using BlockScan, which is basically a way for um, wallets to interact with each other or speak with each other in a chat room like setting. So again, we're, we're leveraging other Web3 technologies to kind of get us through. Um, yeah, in the meantime, you know, he's looking at other artists, and uh, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's say he wants to understand more about different virtual worlds and if he's made the best decision. He can go on learn and get a better idea. So in here, we're kind of giving him an opportunity to stay within our ecosystem, but also have different, different ways of keeping himself engaged, right? So um, the key takeaways that I want to include here is that, um, the Web3 is really just like this evolving landscape where we don't really know, we, we have an idea of what the users want, but it's an ongoing dialogue between us and the users to understand where are the pain points and what can we do to solve them. Um, the, it's, it's ones that's shared by between both of us, right? It's, it's, going, it's a back and forth, and ultimately it's, a, it's one where we want to encourage users to really express themselves, and we want to do that and give them, by giving them the tools um, to really achieve that. Um, so yeah, that, that's really it. We just want them to really uh, have trust in us as a brand, and it's important to have a consistent identity, as well as keeping them in mind as we produce components, as we produce products that uh, address their frustrations. And I don't think that's specific to Web3. I think we all can share that, um, share that concern. So um, that's basically everything. Um, thank you. If you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, you can contact me at agency at meparcel.com. Uh, my LinkedIn is there too. Uh, or you can tweet us, parcel NFT, or, uh, or yeah, go to our site at parcel.so. You get an idea of, um, of what we're doing. Definitely check out Learn. That's a great place to just get introduced to these different virtual worlds. Uh, so yeah, that, that's all I have. Thank you guys. So, hey Adrian, thanks yeah. a lot for your talk. Cool. Uh, a lot of a lot of interesting stuff were showcased, and uh, this topic definitely stirs some emotion and thoughts. So we've received a number of questions. Okay. Uh, from which we'd like to select a few. Uh, mostly, we're going to start with the ones that are highly outvoted. So don't take these as personal. More towards yeah. like the topic itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how is any of this improving the world or adding value to human interactions? Um, I think it already has. I think you could look at like virtual. I think uh, like Second Life, for example. Like a lot of people have like found love, have like interacted with others. Uh, it's like it's even so relevant now with like how COVID had like forced us all back, you know, to being into like inside. Um, it, it gives us an avenue for socializing. I don't think that's ever been really different. I think we've always had that. Um, this is just a new way of really powering creators. You could think of like World of Warcraft where, uh, for example, I sold my account on World of Warcraft to someone else and it was like this sketchy process where I had to like give them my password and then they like gave me some money back. But now it's really, I could just 
I, I actually own my asset. I don't, it's not World of Warcraft or Blizzard owning my account that, and I have the password to it. It's that I actually own my skins, uh, my digital assets, my land, and I have the power to sell that back out anytime. So it gives me a lot more flexibility and options as far as like my financial assets. It, uh, it really is, yeah. So hopefully Thanks. that explains that. Thanks, so. Uh, the next one, uh, how are NFTs not a py pyramid scheme? Uh, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think it's, um, I think anything could be really marketed to, to make you want to buy it. I think crypto itself and NFTs are very volatile and that draws a lot of emotion. You see numbers go up or you see numbers go down and it just, it makes you kind of anxious it makes you like think so far in the future of like what what you know what happens if I lose all my money and I you really shouldn't be pouring money if you don't if you're not comfortable losing it but um, I don't think NFTs are a pyramid scheme I think they're a tool um, I think marketing and I think people who don't have the best intentions um, can really sell you on it or try to sell you on it and I think that's where the pyramid scheme comes in um, and yeah it's people call it a trustless economy or a trustless you know a system but it's, it's not entirely trustless. You still have to know who you're dealing with. You still have to know the people who are developing, like the teams. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not fail-proof at all. Of course not. Uh, we have one that's not anonymous, so I'm going to read that. Who defines and owns this digital world and why? That's a great question. Um, it depends on, the, on each world, really. Um, for example, Decentraland has their own um, DAO. They're a decentralized autonomous organization, but beyond, like that's a layer, and above that, there there is an actual like centralized organization that chooses which assets actually get deployed to in game. So it's not just like anyone can deploy anything. That there could be uh, problems when it comes to copyright or problems when it comes to creating something offensive. So there's actually a core team that chooses after a submission process which assets actually get involved into the game. So that's one example where it's kind of closed. It's, there's a, terms of open metaverse and closed metaverse. That's kind of, it, it, that's where it borders, right? Um, and then you have other things like Sandbox, uh, which I believe they go through a similar process, but you can actually create your assets on the marketplace or on their website, um, and then have, you can deploy it on their marketplace. Um, yeah, I, I think it, I, it's, it's an interesting conversation because um, there is this talk about free speech. There's this talk about like what can, what can and can't be shown or or used um, on the, like in these on the blockchain really. Um, as far as like, yeah, like freedom of speech. Like what can you do and don't don't do. And I think it's really up to the developers of each team of each world to filter that out. And because really they're the ones creating the experience or creating the engine that provides the experience. Um, yeah, and then I think as well, just as, this is a good example, NFT Worlds was one that was built on the Minecraft engine, and then Microsoft had come in um, not that long after it was getting hype, and, Micro um, and Microsoft was saying that they, they're not, they don't condone any real NFT technology, and they don't condone Minecraft being used as an NFT world or uh, metaverse virtual world technology. After that, NFT World kind of crashed in price. A lot of people dipped. Um, but it's actually interesting because now NFT World's developers are recreating a new engine. They're not going to quit. So it's, again, it's this open dialogue and so interesting. And of course, I mean, personally, I'm, I might be on the hook for saying this, but I don't think Microsoft is really going to drop NFTs. You might see them like adopt something like that in the near future. So, yeah. Thanks. Uh, let's see a few more. I think we have some more time. Um, What's the justification and point of creating a virtual land and NFTs while crypto mining is destroying the real world we live in? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, what's the justification and point of creating a virtual land and NFTs while crypto mining destroys the world we live in? I mean, you could argue that now Ethereum is, on, is a proof of stake system, so we're no longer um, really rewarding miners as much as we did before. Um, I will say that everything is just running on, you know, on machines crunching numbers. Um, I don't think that's entirely different than other systems that we have currently. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good conversation to have. Um, and one I'm not super educated on as far as power consumption versus other means of consumption. Like, is it any different than um, cloud servers and other, other data centers? Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really quite know. It's, that's a really good topic and I don't have the answer for you for that one. 
may be good for a Twitter discussion. <laughs> uh, so the next one, what's the div dividing line between regular currency based video games and the metaverse? Yeah, I think uh, going back to like the, the World of Warcraft example, um, basically these companies own the assets ultimately. If I have to sign into an account that they, that they have rights over, like I, ha I have a password, but really it's like I, I have a password to account on their database, right? And so my assets are listed somewhere on their database. Um, I'm really only able to transfer and do with like what I wish with those assets as far as those centralized organizations really allow me to have that power over. Um, but the metaverse is really this idea that these NFT assets, again, it doesn't matter which virtual world we're talking about, they're all NFTs. So there's a base layer where all these things can interop with each other. And that's the idea with the metaverse is really is that, yeah, they're all virtual worlds, but they're not entirely um, self-contained. They're actually, they're actually interconnected, and we'll see that in the future. We'll see different worlds interopping with each other. And um, yeah, it'll be, pre it'll be pretty, pretty interesting to see what kind of conversations or what kind of experiences we can get out of that. Yep. Thanks. Uh, let's see the next one here. Uh, oh, these, these keep popping up. It's just hard to keep track. Uh, why, why buy virtual land versus real land? Um, I mean, that's a good question. Which one can you afford? Um, so yeah, I mean, virtual land is definitely a lucrative idea. Like what if it's, it's, uh, it's one where I can't really give you an answer because it's entrepreneurial, right? It's like, what can you do with virtual land? Can you connect brands? Can you create your own brand? Can you get, can you rent out your space to others? Like what if you, there's already giant brands, um, getting involved like Adidas, for example, um, they have land. Um, I believe in Sandbox, I might be wrong. But so they already have land. And what would it be best for you to buy land close to Adidas? Because then from there, you now have a lot of foot traffic, virtual foot traffic, coming around close in proximity to your land. So you could argue that there is um, an opportunity there as far as um, advertisement, as far as getting eyes on your product. Um, yeah, and I think it's just another way of getting people to pay attention to what you have. Um, we're not limited again. Again, we're not limited to physicality. So it's, 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 there's some level of accessibility from this that you don't have from virtual land, or from physical land, sorry. But uh, yeah, that's a good question too. Great, uh, you're really good. It seems like you've been training for this. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so let's take a, a, a philosophical one. Uh, are you not worried that when we move more and more activities into the metaverse, corporations will turn out entire lives into ad spaces? Um, no, I mean, that's very true. I mean, like, look, like uh, Ready Player One kind of addressed that. I think it's very true, especially when you look at meta. Um, I think it's very consumer driven as far as like trying to extract money or data from you. And I don't, yeah, I don't think, let's see, let me read that one more time. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a fair concern. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, let's see one more. Uh, w which one got the most upvotes? Um, another one from Casey. Is there standardization in the digital landscape, or is it the wild, wild west? Oh, it's definitely the wild west. Yeah, there is there's no, I mean, standardization is something that we are reaching towards. Now there's um, different organizations within the metaverse space, at least, of creating um, a standardized asset class or a standardized uh, 3D model format. There's already GLBs, but we're, there's, a, there's even a further push to make that standardized. Uh, there's even, um, what's the name of it? Oof, can't quite remember the name. Pixar has its own 3D format um, to create scenes, and it's a very node-based system. It's very flexible, and there's drive to adopt Pixar's, uh, oh, it's called USD, Universal Scene Description or Descriptor. Um, and it's a very collaborative way to create 3D scenes, not just 3D models. So we, can, might, we might see that in the future, which would be very cool. Um, yeah, but it is still the Wild West because everyone's staking their claim and proving that they are, they are it, they are the solution, and it's really no one quite knows yet. Um, that's kind of why we adopted the approach that we're selling shovels. We're not, selling the, we're not quite selling the land itself, right? Um, so yeah. Uh, let's, let's take the last question now. Uh, how volatile is the meta market based on your experience? How will it react to potential economic crisis? Yeah, I think we're seeing that play out right now. Um, 
It, it can be quite volatile, like the example I was saying with NFT worlds, where as soon as Microsoft, like, I, I thought that was brilliant, um, using, Microsoft, uh, using Minecraft as the engine for driving NFT content or displaying NFT content. Like, that, it's, it's already there, it exists, everyone's, adopt, like, everyone's already used it, um, and that, that sounded like a great idea. But then as soon as Microsoft, which owns the engine, said that they are not cool with that, um, just sales dunk, so a lot of people kind of dropped out. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's very volatile, just like crypto, and I think you know, real life events will definitely affect the market. Um, we'll see people pull out money because we don't live in a virtual world, we're physical people. So we have physical needs, and those are gonna take over any kind of virtual needs. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a fair, um, fair concern. Thank you very much. Cool. I think we're at the end All of right. the Q&A process. Uh,